So this is the last talk of the day, so I will, uh, I will be non-technical. But uh, what I'd like to uh, talk about a little bit is uh, our problems connected to understanding structure and geometry of uh, high dimensional landscapes or high dimensional functionals. And in particular, I wanted to uh, focus on special points within these landscapes, which are the saddles. And the reason is that uh, these points uh, are expected to play a very uh, crucial role whenever you want to understand how these functionals are explored. Uh, dynamically by uh, the various systems which are associated to them. And this is what I'll try to uh, motivate in a minute. But uh, somehow before I just have a couple of uh, slides which are quite introductory uh, to motivate why one should be interested into uh, looking at these problems of geometry in very high dimension. And I think that this moves from one observation which is very basic, which is that there are many systems that we want to uh, understand theoretically that are intrinsically high dimensional. And by this, I just mean that to describe the configuration of the system, you really need many parameters or variables, which you can then encode into configuration vectors, which will belong to spaces that are very high dimensional. So I will denote in here with this uh, capital N, the dimension of these spaces. And I will think of this as being some uh, very large parameter in, in, uh, in all of the calculations. So what are these systems? Well, in general, they are very heterogeneous systems with heterogeneous interactions. So you may think about uh, neural networks, but also uh, large ecosystems with very many species that uh, interact with each other. Financial markets or models of economies where you have firms and banks and investors that interact. Protein assemblies, but also, of course, systems to which we are more used to in, in statistical physics, like uh, interacting particles or spins. And the idea is that often you can picture the dynamical evolution of these systems as uh, the system attempting to optimize some landscape or some function of the configuration by performing local moves in this configuration space. So this could be either some energy or free energy that you want to minimize, or it could be a fitness that you want to maximize in biology or a utility function in economics and so on and so forth. And what makes this problem uh, potentially quite challenging is the fact that whenever you increase the dimension of this configuration space, you see that typically these functionals tend to become more and more glassy, so like in this picture. So they tend to be very non-convex. So for example, if you think about minimization, what happens if, is that you start having a number of local minima which grows as much as an exponential in the dimension of this uh, underlying configuration space. And all of these local minima, of course, are metastable states for your dynamics. So they are metastable because they are suboptimal with respect to the global minimum, that is the equilibrium state, if you want, uh, that the system would like to reach uh, eventually. But they are local attractors for the dynamics because they are locally stable. And so you end up having a situation in which you have an explosive number of these uh, equilibria that compete with each other. And this, of course, can give rise uh, to a dynamics, which is very complicated. Now, obviously, this idea of uh, interpreting dynamics as uh, optimization of functionals is, uh, is not new, so it has quite a long history, particularly if you think about biology or, or soft matter. So, uh, for example, what I'm uh, reporting in here is, um, is taken from a paper of 1932, so this is uh, Wright, who was a genetist, who is uh, discussing in here uh, broadly about uh, evolution. And he is indeed suggesting to interpret evolutionary dynamics as a walk of some points, which represents your species or your individuals, along the surface of what we would call uh, nowadays a fitness function, which is a function of the genotype, for instance, of your species, and which measures what is the ability of this uh, individual to reproduce themselves uh, in some given fixed environment. And so, as you see, he was already well aware of the fact that the problem is, uh, is very high dimensional because you have this huge number of, in principle, uh, possibly accessible genotypes uh, for your species. And this high dimensionality can uh, induce some complexity in the structure of the functional and therefore in the dynamics. So in particular, what he writes is that uh, selection, so selection is the mechanism here which corresponds to optimization because it pushes you towards higher values of, P, of uh, this fitness. So this will easily carry the species to the nearest peak, but there may be innumerable, so possibly exponentially other peaks, which are higher, but which are separated by valleys. And so the problem of evolution, as I see it, uh, he writes, is that of a mechanism by which the species may continually find its way from lower to higher peaks. 
And of course, you may expect this type of dynamical processes to be uh, somehow hard to be realized because of course the system is happy at the end because you maximize the fitness, but in between you have to go through this valley. So you have to make excursions to configurations which, um, which are not very good. And this selection is against this. So you need some mechanism to compensate for this optimization driving. And if the mechanism is not too strong, you will have very slow uh, dynamical processes of this type. And so if you look at this, this is uh, exactly the scenario for uh, the dynamics, which later on has been uh, exported, uh, if you want, to the context of uh, systems which are glassy, where you replace uh, these fitness landscapes by energy landscapes or, uh, or free energy landscapes. And just to mention, more recently, this type of optimization problems in high dimension are emerging also in, in a lot of different contexts, uh, which are unrelated to glasses. So you may think about problems of supervised learning, where uh, whenever you want to train these artificial neural networks, you have to really solve uh, an optimization problem for functions or, or try to solve uh, optimization problems for functions which are indeed uh, very high dimensional. Uh, or you can even think about problems of quantum computing and quantum dynamics, uh, such as uh, optimal control problems. And there you will also see that there are high dimensional landscapes emerging that are usually called uh, fidelity landscapes in this context. But now, if you look at the literature, uh, in particular at the uh, theoretical literature, what you may see is that actually the models which are introduced for this type of landscapes are uh, quite similar to each other, and they are very much rooted into some uh, statistical physics perspective. And what I mean by this is that what you do is you take these complicated functionals and you just replace them by random functions with a given statistics that uh, typically you choose to be Gaussian uh, because, um, because this is convenient uh, if you want to perform calculations. So the first thing you have to do is to figure out what is a good configuration space. So for example, in the example uh, in the following, I will consider this just to be the surface of a sphere in very high dimension n. And then to each point of this space, you associate uh, a value of this functional that I will call an energy from now on, which is a function of the configuration. Here, I just tailor expanded it. And you have coefficients that you choose to be random variables. And uh, typically, as I said, you choose them to be independent and Gaussian. And so if you do this, you have a functional that is itself Gaussian, and this defines for you a very broad class of models, which are uh, these so-called random Gaussian functionals. And uh, just to, to give an example, in the following, I will focus on what is perhaps the simplest case in here, which corresponds to neglecting this sum over p and choosing just one fixed value of p. So you just have a, a polynomial of fixed degree with random coefficients. And this is what is known in, in the literature of glasses as the spherical PSPIN model, which people have been uh, studied uh, extensively as a mean field model for, uh, for the glass transition. And then for the dynamics, what you can do is uh, to uh, model it with, uh, or to consider Langevin dynamics. So you have two terms. The first one is simply gradient descent, which corresponds to this optimization. So it's biased toward uh, lower values of the energy and local minima. And then you add some noise, which I take here to be uh, white noise with a covariance proportional to temperature. And I will assume that temperature is small. So if you think, for instance, to, to evolution, this would be genetic drift, which uh, competes with your selection mechanism that is uh, essentially the equivalent of the gradient. Now, if you think in these terms, and if you assume uh, that the noise is small, then you can expect that an important role to, to understand this uh, Langevin dynamics will be played precisely by those points where the gradient is exactly equal to zero that are attractors in absence of the noise. And these are the stationary points of your uh, landscape functional. So if you have no noise, your dynamics will drive you towards the closest one. Let's say it's a local minimum. If you switch on a little bit of noise, then you, what you expect is that you will perform fluctuations within uh, one of these minima. And then only at very rare times, you find uh, uh, large fluctuations of your noise, which is rare, but which uh, may occur. And this is so large that it allows you to compensate for the gradient, which pushes you down. And so it allows you to climb up in the energy landscape and eventually go uh, somewhere else in your configuration space and visit other local minima. And uh, typically, the way you may expect this to happen is passing through saddles, which are uh, again stationary points, but with some direction of negative curvature so with some unstable direction for, uh, for your dynamics. 
So you basically want to understand how these uh, stationary points are distributed to try to uh, address uh, this type of activated dynamics. But the issue in here is that you have very many of them. So what you want to understand is what is their distribution in terms of the energy, so of the value of the function, in terms of their stability, so how many minima, how many saddles you have, maybe as a function of the energy, and also in terms of their position or also of their uh, connectivity, if you want, in your uh, underlying configuration space. And I just want to stress that this setting in which we uh, somehow put ourselves, which is the one in, in which our function is just a random function and dimensionality is very large, is very convenient because you can use tools, which are statistical tools on one end, uh, and tools that are somehow mean field like on the other hand, like random matrix theory or large deviations, which I will mention in the following. And these are very convenient because they allow to address, uh, they allow you to address explicitly uh, some of the questions about uh, the distribution of those points and therefore uh, also about the dynamics. So uh, what I'd like to do in, in the remaining of the talk is, as I said, to focus on this uh, simple example of uh, random landscapes. And I'd like to summarize a little bit uh, what is known about the distribution of these stationary points. Uh, many of these results were already well known. So there is a lot of literature of uh, the end of the 90s by uh, glassy people. So I will uh, summarize that. And then I will tell you uh, what is the new contribution uh, that uh, we give. Okay, so, so the first thing that uh, was very well known is uh, essentially what is the number of these points as a function of the energy, which here I'm rescaling, uh, introducing this energy density. So the idea is you have this functional and what you do is you take a level set or a cut uh, at a fixed value of energy and you know what is the number of minima and saddles that you find in there for typical realizations of your random functional and at the exponential scale. So you basically know how to compute this curve in here that is the so-called complexity, which is related to the logarithm of the number of stationary points that is plotted here as a function of the energy density. So here I'm looking at energy densities, which are small. So at the bottom of my uh, landscape and as a function of this index K, which is related to the stability. So of course, if you think about stability, what you have to do is to look at the curvature. So you, you have to look at the Hessian matrix of the second derivatives of your functional evaluated uh, at a point where the gradient is zero. And you have to look at the eigenvalue of this uh, matrix, which tell you what is the curvature uh, in a quadratic approximation around the stationary point. And the index K here is just counting what is the number of negative eigenvalues. So, so you see that you have a curve on top, which corresponds to K equal to zero. So this uh, is, is the curve of minima, which have no uh, direction of negative curvature. They are, the curvature is positive everywhere. And then you have the saddles of index one, two, three, and so on. And they are all uh, organized in a very uh, hierarchical way in this uh, particular landscape. And uh, this organization is something that you can actually uh, understand uh, quite simply uh, by looking precisely at the properties of these Hessian matrices. So of course, in here you have a random function. So if you look at the matrix of second derivatives, you will have a random matrix. And if your function is Gaussian, you typically have Hessians which have statistics that is related to the statistics of matrices taken from uh, Gaussian orthogonal ensembles. And in particular for the Hessians of the P-spin, you can really show that the statistics is exactly the same as a GOE matrix shifted by some term which depends on the energy density of the points uh, that you're looking. And so if you choose these energy densities uh, small enough, you ask what is the typical spectrum of, uh, of an Hessian at a stationary point? And you will find that this looks like this. So this is a semicircle low, semicircular low, which is given by the GOE. And it is shifted by the energy in such a way that it is supported uh, on the positive semi-axis. And so this tells you that typically with probability, which is of order one in the dimension of the matrix, which is uh, capital N, you have the spectrum of a minimum. But then you can also ask, what is the probability to uh, find uh, weak deformations to this spectrum? So to, for example, uh, take one single eigenvalue and pull it out of the semicircle and make it negative so that you have the spectrum of a saddle of index one. And this is now a large deviation probability that you can compute explicitly for, uh, for a GOE and it is exponentially small in N. And this is precisely the reason why if you ask then what is the number of saddles, 
you find this exponential suppression in the complexity uh, because you are computing it at the exponential scale. So this is due to the suppression in the probability for this configuration of the spectrum of the Eschen. Okay, so this is uh, one type of information that was, uh, as I said, uh, very well known. The other thing that you can ask is, well, you know uh, that you have very many minima in saddles, where are these stationary points in your underlying configuration space, which is uh, this sphere? So suppose that I select one particular local minimum of a given energy density, I can ask what is, or what is the typical distance of the majority of my other saddles and, and local minimum, minima. And uh, so here I'm measuring distance in terms of, of the overlap, which is the scalar product between uh, the underlying configurations. And what you actually find in here is that the majority of these points are actually very far away from any reference minimum that you choose. So they typically have a value of the overlap, which is exactly zero. So in this picture, if I put the minimum uh, in the North Pole, I find that almost all of my stationary points are far away at the equator. And this is just because your space is very high dimensional. So I'm plotting here a sphere in, in in 2D, but this is very misleading. So if you are in, in high dimension, the sphere is much, much squeezed so that the majority of your surface is at the equator and the fraction of surface, which is at the finite values of Q is actually exponentially smaller. So if most of your phase space is at the equator, there is no surprise that you will find most of your minima and saddles uh, far away from this particular point. But however, if you think about the uh, dynamics, then you realize that this is not what uh, you're interested in because you want to be able to describe these uh, activated jumps and you want to, or you expect these jumps to occur between local minima which are close to each other's in configuration space and which are connected to each other's by some saddle such that if you uh, escape from the saddle, you go down from one or the other minimum uh, with your dynamics. And moreover, you would like to understand starting from the particular minimum that you are targeting, what is the energy of the saddles which are connected to it? And this is important for the dynamics because it tells you what is the energy barrier that your dynamics has to uh, cross. Uh, and therefore it tells you uh, what is the typical time scale if you think at Arrhenius-like dynamics, what is the typical time scale that you should expect for this type of uh, processes to occur. So uh, in essence, what I want to say is that you would like to understand a little bit better the local uh, structure of your landscape close to one particular uh, reference minimum. And this is basically uh, what we do. So I, uh, of course, not go into details, but I just uh, want to uh, connect to what I said before about uh, properties of the action and uh, point out that now what you are doing is conditioning your stationary points to be somewhere in your configuration space. So let's say to be close enough to this particular uh, point in here. And if you then look at the statistics of the action at this uh, point, this conditioning will translate into a modification of these statistics, which takes the form of uh, finite rank perturbations to your matrix. So before you just have a GOE plus a shift, uh, depending on the energy. And now you have the same, but you have to add uh, so basically you will have some entries of your matrix which have a different variance and a different average. And these are the entries which correspond to that direction in configuration space which connects uh, these two uh, stationary points. So you are essentially breaking the isotropy that you had before because you are pushing to go in one particular direction of your uh, configuration space. And this finite rank perturbation, of course, they depend on all of the parameters. So on this distance and on the energy densities of uh, your two points, and they will modify your spectrum. So they, they are responsible for two different things. So the first one is that for some regimes of this parameter, they can pull out one eigenvalue spontaneously from, uh, from your Hessian and make it negative. So what this means, this happens typically when Q becomes large. So when you go closer and closer to the minimum, and this means that typically you go closer and closer, you follow stationary points and you will find that they develop one unstable direction, which goes towards your uh, reference minimum. So they feel the presence of this minimum uh, and this shows up uh, in, in these uh, properties of the curvature. And then of course, if you have uh, an isolated eigenvalue in the spectrum, you can now ask what is the cost in terms of probability to move it from its typical position. Uh, 
which is again a large deviation calculation like uh, the one uh, that I mentioned before, uh, but which will now be modified because you have uh, all of these perturbations to your uh, GOE. So uh, somehow the message is that these are uh, all problems uh, that once you formulate them in this way, and uh, once you use tools of random matrix theory, you can address. So for example, you can compute uh, what is the values, uh, the value of parameters uh, at which you have this transition in the spectrum with one eigenvalues which, uh, which appears, and you can compute when this eigenvalue becomes negative. So this corresponds to transition between uh, minima and sadus. And you can work out what is the full large deviation function, so the probability to, uh, for this eigenvalue to take values which are different with respect to the typical one. And uh, so these are just some plots, but maybe I will just mention that this is a problem which is nice because you find that the large deviations of the smallest eigenvalue depend uh, only on the position of the second uh, smallest eigenvalue and on whether you have transitions in your uh, second smallest eigenvalues. So maybe if anybody is interested, I can uh, comment more uh, about this later. But uh, somehow to conclude, the idea is that you uh, put uh, all of these ingredients uh, together, you go back to this problem of uh, understanding distributions and number, so counting the number of saddles uh, as a function of the distance to the minimum, and you find uh, curves like this. So in here I'm plotting the energy as before, and then I have this extra parameter, which is the overlap with this particular uh, reference minimum. And I should have a third axis, which is the number, so the complexity of the saddles which I'm counting. Uh, and this corresponds to uh, different values of x. Uh, so these are uh, isocomplexity curves. And I will just point out that if you do this type of study, you have different transitions. So for example, you start from your reference minimum, you increase your distance, and at the closers, uh, in the closest region, what you find is that uh, the typical stationary points, so the most numerous that you find in there, are saddles, which are connected to your minimum. Then you have a transition that I call here entropic crossing, where saddles become subleading in number with respect to minima, but nevertheless, they are there and they are exponentially many. So you have to use large deviations to count them, uh, but you can do this. And then eventually, if you go too far away, you find a geometrical transition, which corresponds to the fact that the saddles that you are counting, uh, their negative or unstable direction is no longer pointing toward your minimum in configuration space. And therefore, those are no longer escape states for your dynamics, starting from the particular minimum that, uh, that you are looking at. And this is the case for all of these smaller values of overlap up to the equator that is uh, q equal to zero, where you have the typical uh, stationary points. OK, so I think uh, that's it. So essentially, uh, the summary of what I said is that uh, there are some problems in which you are interested into understanding uh, structure of these uh, functionals, random functionals in this case, in very high dimension. And this uh, essentially boils down to understanding properties of uh, deformed uh, random matrices. And this is a geometrical information that you can directly use then to try to understand the dynamics. So I, I didn't talk about this, but you can uh, really work out, use dynamical equations then to work out, for example, the behavior of correlation functions along these simple jumps uh, that go from one minimum to another, passing through one of the saddles that uh, you can identify uh, in, uh, in this way. And the perspectives are, uh, well, maybe I leave them in here. I, I will just mention that uh, this can be generalized uh, in many directions, including something that maybe is of interest for uh, some people in the audience that is, so this was all about landscapes, so conservative systems. But of course, the examples which I mentioned uh, at the beginning, like ecosystems, economies, and so on, they are typically non-conservative. So you do not have landscapes uh, in there, but you still have uh, many equilibria for uh, the associated dynamical systems and this type of counting uh, techniques can be generalized to that uh, as well. Okay, so I think that's uh, it. Thank you very much, Valentina. Very nice talk. Uh, there is time for questions, uh, uh, although we are a bit late. We have two questions. I would, uh, I would just, uh, yes, uh, propose you just to stop with two questions. Uh, the first from uh, Eric. Hey, Valentina, my question is about something actually on your last slide. So 
you mentioned that most of the work is on the Gaussian case, mm -hmm. but for some problems like uh, reaction networks, for example, the couplings are all positive, they're reaction rates. And so in that case, you often find that the, the couplings have some fat distribution, like a log normal or something. So my question is what can be done in the case when the couplings are all, all positive and also have a fat distribution? Uh, yes, or more generally, what can be done if you go beyond the Gaussianity? Uh, not much, actually, so far. Um, in the sense that everything relies on being able to condition to something, and we know how to condition very easily for Gaussians. But then if you go beyond that, you, I think you have to work uh, case by case. But uh, this is a problem that uh, that is, of course, there. In particular, there is a lot of activity from people looking at problems of uh, lost landscapes, which, of course, you do not expect to be Gaussian, and trying to generalize this cut-trace formalism that is what I use to count uh, stationary points in that case. And there are uh, some, let's say the obstacle there is really that you want to look at Hessians, you want to condition this Hessian to something, and it is very difficult to do this uh, beyond Gaussianity, except for, for particular cases. So I think it's, it's very open. Uh, I can give you some reference which is specifically related to Katz Rice, but in general, I think it's very open. Katz, Katz Rice, what I mean is um, just formulas for the number of stationary points of your function. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, next question from Isaac. Yes, I think I'm afraid I had almost the same question. So I was wondering, uh, what is known about Hessians if the interaction matrix is sparse, what the spectrum of the Hessians is in saddles? Is anything known about that? Or um, well, for uh, okay, for sparsity um, and and starting from this landscape perspective, I I don't really know. What I can tell you is that of course you can build, and there are many cases in which you have statistics which are non-Gaussian, but still which correspond to ensembles of matrices that you can treat uh, and which have some symmetry, so which are Wishart-like or so on. And then you use, again, uh, this uh, random matrix-like machinery uh, to do the calculation. So I think that if you have frameworks in which you can account for sparsity and you can still um, then build a, let's say, random matrix ensemble uh, around that, then you can go on. But, um, but all of the models that I'm thinking about are fully connected and, uh, and no, not sparse. Thank you. Uh, 